Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Acts in chapter 7. Now, this is going to be the third and final week that we're in this seventh chapter. We have seen that Stephanos, that is Stephen, who is going to be murdered at the end of our study tonight. This one was called to give testimony. He was slandered. He was lied about. People were speaking untrue things about him. And what did he do? Well, he didn't defend himself by denying this. He simply stood up and spoke truth. He didn't feel a need to to justify himself, to defend false terms that were placed upon him. He simply spoke scriptural truth concerning Messiah. In other words, he stepped aside in order to put the spotlight, the truth upon Messiah before these individuals. And I want to go back to the verse of scripture that we concluded with last week because it's prophetic. It is a Torah prophecy concerning Messiah. We quickly read it last week, and I want to read it properly this week. So look with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verse 37. The book of Acts and verse 37, it says, And this Moses, he's the one who said to the sons of Israel, A prophet among you, the Lord your God, will raise up, speaking about the resurrection of Messiah. And this prophet is going to be from your brethren, meaning he has to be Jewish. And as me, meaning he's a redeemer. That's the implication of Moses saying, as me. Finally, he says, him you shall hear. And this word, him, because it comes before you shall hear, it's emphatic. Him, meaning Messiah. And this word here comes with the understanding that it's a call to obedience. So, Stephanos, he's who was accused of turning away from the Torah. He's been speaking Torah truth for quite a while. And now he's showing us the foundation of the Torah, the purpose of the Torah, what the Torah wanted to reveal, and that is this coming prophet who is a redeemer, who comes from the house of Israel. It is this one that the people are called to obey. It's this one that Stephanos is sharing, he's teaching about. It's this one that the apostles are sharing with the Sanhedrin. But here it's Stephanos. And notice something else. Look at verse 38. Verse 38 has a very important word. It is the word ecclesia or the word church. But it's not speaking about those that are in faith with Messiah. After Messiah's resurrection and ascension. No, he's going back to the time of Moses in the wilderness. Look again. This is the one who was, and the word here, was with, with them in the congregation in the wilderness, with the angel who spoke to him at the mountain of Sinai. And our fathers, we see that they receive this living word to give to us. So he's speaking here about Moses, who was with this congregation in the wilderness, but it uses the word church. Now, why is that? Well, in Hebrew, it is the word edah, which is a congregation, but it's related to the word 
to testify, to bear witness. And it speaks of the fact that those that came out of Egypt were supposed to testify of their redemption. And the Redeemer was Moses. He fulfilled that role. And now, based upon this passage from Deuteronomy, this Messianic prophecy, Stephen is telling the people that Moses, he was with this congregation. But why does it use that word ecclesia? Well, all of that congregation or the church, all of them had something in common. They had a Passover experience. And I've said this before in numerous other messages and study. Everyone who came out of Egypt, they had a Passover experience. They dealt appropriately with the blood of the Lamb. And everyone who's going to come out of this world and enter into the kingdom of God, they're going to have to have a Passover experience in the Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, having dealt with his blood properly. So here Stephanos is saying, Moses had it right. He spoke about a prophet who would rise up. And this is Yeshua. Where he is going in this discourse, he's bringing the Sanhedrin to the right understanding of Yeshua Menatzrat, that is, Jesus of Nazareth. Look again at our text. We read, This one was in the congregation in the wilderness with that angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and our fathers who received these living words to give to us. Verse 39 but they did not want to be obedient. Here's the problem. Nothing has changed. Stephanos is saying that these individuals that were in the wilderness, they received revelation, but they rejected it. They did not want to obey it. They did want to hear and respond properly. And why is he saying this? Because he's teaching, he's revealing that the Sanhedrin has that same character. They're behaving in that same way. Our fathers, they did not want to be obedient, but it says they did something. They pushed him away and they turned their hearts to Egypt. Now, the one who they pushed away was Moses. They rejected him, and if you read the Torah, I'm speaking about in the book of Exodus and Numbers primarily, those two books, you will find several times, and I mention this frequently, that the congregation in the wilderness, the house of Israel, the sons of, of, of Israel, what happened? They rejected Moses over and over and over, even unto the extent that they wanted to stone Moses. Moses was a rejected Messiah, but God's faithful and delivered him. And in that same way, God is faithful to the true Messiah, and that is Yeshua. He delivered him from death, raising him from dead to death. That's what this prophecy from Deuteronomy mentions. That's why Stephen is choosing it here. So they, they push Moses away, they turn their hearts to Egypt, saying to Aaron, saying to Aaron, verse 40, make for us gods that we might uh, uh, turn before, that we might turn before, meaning that we want to follow them, and the implication is back to Egypt. Egypt, a place of idolatry, that we might go before. Verse 40, the second half. For this Moses, who has led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has become to him. Now, depending upon the Bible that you are using, I'm assuming, assuming that most of the people are following in English, and they will say in this passage, those translations, you know, we do not know what has become of him. If you're using a, a normal Bible that's translated from the standard Greek text of today, which I think is an inferior text, 
It will have it as simply as I translated it. But the Texas Receptus, it has this same verb, but it's in the perfect. And what's the nuance here? And it's hard to translate it into English, but as we teach and look at it, we can elaborate more. They say, we don't know what has happened to him, what's become of him. But this word for happening or became to him is in the perfect in the Texas Receptus. What does that mean? They don't know what happened to him previously when he went up on the mountain. We don't know where he is now. And the implication is we won't know in the future what's become of him. In other ways, they are saying we don't want anything to do with Moses. Now, they're lying. Why? They saw Moses go up. The, the mountain is quaking with fire and smoke and the sound of the shofar and other things, thundering. So God is at work there. They were told to wait for him until he returned. I think there's great theological significance in that. That Moses went up and the people were supposed to wait faithfully until he returned, but they did not. Why? Because they weren't interested in where Moses wanted to lead them. And when we aren't interested in where God is leading us into a kingdom experience, we're going to go back to a, a former lifestyle. So when we're not kingdom-minded, we're not passionate about our future. We don't have a strong faith in the future that God is going to give to us. If that's the case, we don't believe that. We're going to be like them and go back to Egypt, meaning go back to the world and a worldly lifestyle. Look now to verse 41. And they made the calf in those days. And we read here that they offered sacrifices to the idol. And this is important because it speaks of idolatry. Israel fell quickly into idolatry. And the context of this is so important. If we forget this, we're going to miss out on a very fundamental teaching. Moses went up on that mountain in order to bring before the people the commandments of God, the law. And what did they do? They said, no, thank you. We'll go back to idolatry. And whenever we move away from a Torah obedience, now what I'm speaking about, when we are not interested in the righteousness of God, and we look at these things as, oh, legalism and uh, corruption, a thing of the past, something that's a burden, something that is inadequate. Let me tell you, it is the commandments of God that, that reveal the character of the kingdom. We need to realize that. Ki mitzion tetzei Torah, udvar Adonai meirushalayim, which means, and I'm quoting from Isaiah chapter 2, and this prophecy is for the last times, the end times, the kingdom experience, that millennial kingdom. And the law will go forth from Zion, Udvar Adonai, and the word of the Lord, Meyushalayim, from Jerusalem. That is a kingdom experience. And when we aren't interested in the commandments, you say, well, I'm not saved by the commandments. That's right. But having been saved, what does Paul say? The commandment is not for the carnal individual, but for the spiritual. So when we walk in the Spirit, we are going to be demonstrating Torah observance. Not through the letter, but the Spirit of the law. And that's what these people were not doing. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They fell into idolatry, and they were offering up sacrifices to idols. Now look, if you would, to the second part of verse Verse 41, and they, it says here, they rejoice in the work of their hands. Now, we should rejoice in the work of God, what he's doing, but they didn't. They found great satisfaction satisfying their flesh through the works of their hands. Why? It was like they wanted it to be. They were in charge, and that's the problem. One of the purposes of the Torah, when we are wise enough and humble enough and brave enough 
to read the commandments. You know what? When we read those commandments, we are going to find out that we are, are oftentimes turning away from God's expectations, that we are hindering, quenching the Holy Spirit's ministry in our life. So we read here in this passage, they rejoice in the works of their hands, and we find that God turned, he turned away, and delivered them to the worship of, and the word here is hosts of heaven. And it's speaking about a, a demonic spiritual, spiritual realm. It's not the normal phrase in the good sense, the host of heaven is always in the plural, but this is singular. And it's to show inferior. They had a spiritual experience, but it was inferior one. It was a different nature altogether. So God turned them over. God delivered them to worship the host of heaven just as it had been written in the Bible or the book of the prophets. And here we find a reference to their inappropriate, insufficient sacrificial system. What they were doing when they were worshiping idols in the wilderness, it says here, uh, did they not offer uh, uh, sacrificial or slain animals and sacrifices? So they brought forth these slain beasts and sacrifices to me for 40 years in the desert. Who did this? The house of Israel. And what God is saying here is that he was not pleased with these offerings. Even though they did it unto him, he was not pleased by them. And how do we know that? Well, look at verse 43. Here's an example of what they were doing. And they, they lifted up or took up the tabernacle, but not a pure tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moloch. Now, Moloch is a pagan god whereby the children of Israel, and hear this, they sacrifice their infants. They burn them with fire to Moloch. And this just shows us that when we begin to move away from God, embracing what we think is right, we are on a journey to do what we would never imagine we would do. We can have our conscience seared. We can fall into a, a situation whereby we are doing the unthinkable actions that we would never begin doing as we start this wrong journey. But going on that journey is going to lead to unbelievable, unspeakable acts. And notice something else. And the star of your God, it's not the God of Israel, it is what? Remphan. And this is a pagan God, and it says as we keep reading, and the images which you made to worship them. So they're going to worship, and this is what I said in another message. People are going to worship. The question is who? Either the God of Israel or pagan gods which Satan receives the honor and the glory and the praise. When people who are created by God turn away from him and embrace the devil. And that's what Stephanos is saying happened to Israel in the wilderness. And we could also say, What's going to happen to Israel in the last days? And furthermore, it described them at this time. Now, Stephen, he wasn't uh, mixing words, was he? He was being very blatant to them that Israel had a problem with understanding the things of God, quickly turning away and falling into idolatry. Look now to verse 44. And what did he do? He changed their location. What is that a reference to? Galut in Hebrew, exile. He changed their location beyond Babylon. Now, he's foreshadowing something. And that is this. What he's giving a hint to is a prophetic reality. In the same way that the children of Israel 
fell into idolatry, not understanding the truth of Moshe Rabbeinu, that is, Moses, our teacher. When they missed out on that first paradigm of God's appointed leader, what happened? They went into exile. And now what he's going to share with them is in rejecting Yeshua, that is, the Savior, Messiah, Jesus, in rejecting him, they can expect to as well go into exile. So he changed their location beyond Babylon, verse 44. And the tabernacle of testimony or the tabernacle of witness was to our fathers in the wilderness, just as the one speaking to Moses commanded, commanded Moses to make it according to all which he saw. Now, the point here is that Moses was given a revelation. He was given a revelation on how to make the tabernacle of witness. Now, there's two points that God's teaching in this verse. First of all, what was in the wilderness, that tabernacle, that later became in Jerusalem as a temple, it was a pattern of what he saw up above. Now, we know that. We've studied the book of, of Hebrews recently. We're in the midst of that, and it testifies to that. So Moses was saying, in the scripture, in the Torah, that everything that he made was based upon the pattern which he saw. And this is what the one who was speaking to Moses, what he commanded him to build according to the, the image that he saw, or the example, verse 45. Which also our fathers, they uh, entered into, and not only that, it says here that they received possession of with Joshua. Now, by the way, in the Greek, and that's what I'm looking at, this word Joshua is the word Iesus. It's in the genitive Iesu. And it's the same name as Joshua because Joshua is the correct enunciation of that name in Hebrew. So Joshua or Jesus or Yeshua were speaking here about the same name, which means salvation. The pattern here is that Joshua did something. That he, look at the scripture once more, he brought them into take possession. Who's that? Our fathers. Joshua brought them in to take possession of this, this inheritance here, this possession of of the nations whom he cast out. Who did God cast them out from before our fathers until the days of David? What is the biblical truth? One by the name Joshua, same name as Yeshua or Jesus. He acted in a way to cause those who were following him to take possession of what God had promised. And they were there, it says, until the days of David. And David, whenever we talk about David, it's also a reference to the son of David or Messiah, whom found grace before God and sought to find the tabernacle unto the God of Jacob. Now, why is Jacob mentioned here? Well, Jacob, patriarch, promise. But remember what we talked about earlier when we came across that same root in the Hebrew. Ein kuf veit has to do with reward. This is this tabernacle for the God of Jacob. It is a reference to a reward. What is that reward? Worship. Worshiping God in the land of Israel meaning in the future paradigm in the kingdom of God. And the same way, what he's teaching is this, is the same way that Joshua brought the people into a possession, casting out the enemies so that the sons of Jacob could take possession and worship God. What is Yeshua doing? He is going to bring us into a kingdom. 
But that is also going to be paralleled by the Jewish people returning to the land, casting out the enemies in order that a kingdom might be established. And that's why the millennial kingdom is so important. It completes the pattern of, of the scripture, both Old Testament prophecy and New Testament truth. If you reject the millennial kingdom, and by the way, within evangelical Christianity, more and more that is being done. More and more people are what's called amillennialists, which means they deny, they reject a thousand-year kingdom from the Jerusalem of today that Messiah is going to rule over. And some people will say, oh, I'm pre-millennial. I believe Messiah is going to come before the millennial. But here's the problem. They use words, and if you listen to what they say, they're disingenuous. Why is that? Because when you look at their understanding of the millennial, they, they put together the new Jerusalem with it. And they just want to say the millennial is synonymous with a kingdom and Messiah is coming back before the kingdom. But they don't see it as a literal thousand-year kingdom that Messiah will rule over from the holy city of Jerusalem, that is the Jerusalem of our days, before establishing a new Jerusalem, which is that final state of the kingdom. It's only when we have the proper paradigms are we going to arrive at the proper understanding. Look again. Which also our fathers, they entered in, and what did they do? They received, they received with Joshua a possession of the nations, which God cast them out before our fathers until the days of David. Now, David is always a messianic indicator which, notice what he found, that's so related to Messiah, whom he found, that is David, grace before God, and he sought to find this tabernacle for the God of Jacob. He wanted it to be established, but he didn't. It moves on. Look at verse 47. But Solomon built it, built to him, excuse me, Solomon built to him a house, meaning to God, but, we read here, but the Most High, referring to the Most High God, but just as the Most High does not dwell in a sanctuary made by hands, just as the prophet says. Now, I had to translate it, and I want to read what it literally says. But not the exalted one in that which is made by hands, a sanctuary dwells. Now, the implication is God does not dwell in a sanctuary made by human hands. We keep reading, just as the prophet says, look at verse 49. The heaven is my throne, and the land is a footstool for my feet. So God's kingdom is beyond that. This is just a paradigm. But in actuality, there's going to be something greater than that millennial kingdom, and that is that new Jerusalem. So my throne is the heavens, my footstool is the land, and we read, what is the house that uh, you can build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? And rest is a reference to kingdom. So even though there was that first pattern in Jerusalem and there's going to be a fulfillment of that in the new millennial kingdom, that is not the final expression of God. There's going to be something greater when God enters into his final rest with his people. And rest here has nothing to do with being tired, but rest here is seen, this word is related to gift, it's related to intimacy. It's related to fellowship. So, or what is the place of my rest? And the answer is kingdom. And that's why he says, was it not my hand that made all of these? What's he trying to say here? Ultimately, the one who's going to make the dwelling place for God, that is the new Jerusalem, is God himself. All these things were just patterned. 
to help us understand and prepare for that final kingdom experience. And what is the object, ob, objective of Stephanos here? Well, he wants to tie Messiah Yeshua to this full kingdom experience. Now move to verse 51. Here we're going to find what the problem is for Israel and what the problem is for humanity. And that is the stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ear. We have a tendency, Israel demonstrated that, but so does the church. We all have that tendency in being stiff-necked. What does that mean? Not humbled. We can't bow. We can't show exhortation, uh, exaltation to God, to praise Him, to worship Him. So a stiff neck and an uncircumcised heart and ear, you always rebel against the Holy Spirit. Now, why is the Holy Spirit mentioned here? Well, what normally do I speak of when I make reference to the Holy Spirit? The answer is God's order. So he's teaching here, there is that constant tendency among humanity. Israel demonstrated, but it's for all humanity, that we tend to be stiff-necked, uncircumcised, meaning we don't walk in the flesh, but we walk in and we don't walk in the spirit, we walk in the flesh, excuse me, say it again, we tend not to walk in the spirit, we tend to walk in the flesh. So he reads, always you resist, literally you fall against the Holy Spirit, as your fathers also you. And that's what it literally says. Some English Bibles add more words, but literally... What we find here, as the fathers also you, verse 52. Which of the prophets, speaking about Israel's history, which of the prophets did they not, that is, your fathers did not persecute? Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed the ones who was proclaiming previously concerning the coming of the righteous one. When we look at the prophets, the ones who were killed, Messiah taught this at the end of Matthew 23, but also we find this message of rejection, of persecution against the prophets. When? Well, in the book of Jeremiah and in so many other places, prophets were rejected. And what did they speak of? What was the primary thing of prophecy? The coming of Messiah. But notice how Messiah is spoken about here. He is called the righteous one. Now you also are traitors or betrayers and murderers. This is what you've become. And it's the heritage of what? The heritage of those who reject prophecy. Because who are you? He says, who are the ones who receive the law? The law which we find here was was given by angels, you did not, you did not receive, or you did not keep is a better way of saying it. So they were traitors and murderers. That's what they become. Who? You did not receive the law in order to, to uh, from angels. You didn't receive it properly from angels as you should. But what did you do? You didn't keep it. So it's speaking here about... Uh, um, the oracles. Let me translate that again. You did not receive the oracles, the law, for the oracles of an angels. This is something very important that they're speaking about the law, and you did not keep it. Now, verse 54. Now, hearing these things, verse 54, we're going to see the response of the people to Stephen's words, the Sanhedrin more, more precisely. But hearing these things, they were cut to their hearts. They fell under conviction, but not a righteous conviction, but a conviction that leads to rebellious. And they gnashed their teeth at him, and they became full, it says here, they, they became full, and being, excuse it, speaks about Stephen in verse 55, and being full of the Holy Spirit, 
This one, referring to Stephen, he looked into the heavens and he saw the glory of God and Yeshua standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opening up and the Son of Man at the right hand standing of God, the right hand of God standing. Now, I read that, and you might say, well, the order's incorrect. And for translation, we could see that. Look again. He saw the glory of God and Yeshua standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I perceive the heavens opening up, and the Son of Man at the right hand standing of God. Now, why is the word standing interrupting this phrase? Well, when something interrupts, it's to show emphasis. And the word here for standing is very important. It's in the perfect, meaning that he has stood there previously. He's standing there now, and he will continue to be in the future at the right hand of God. What does this show? It shows this eternal intimacy between God the Father and God the Son. It speaks about the divinity of Messiah, always being the divine Son of God. And it's only when we look at it in the natural or the original language do we see these things being manifested and taught to us. We'll now look at verse 57. And crying in a loud voice, they, they press, literally they press their ears. Now, your Bibles may say they stopped their ears. Well, they stopped them up by pressing. They did not want to hear what Stephen was saying. And what did they do? Look at the middle of verse 57. And they rushed in one accord at him, and casting him outside the city, they stoned. Also, the witnesses, what do we find here? The witnesses, they laid the garments, their garments at the feet of a young one called Saul. And who is that? Well, this is the apostle Paul. And Stephen, Stephen being stoned, so, and they stoned Stephen. And he called out and said, Lord, Yeshua, receive my spirit. And he placed his knees, meaning he bowed down on his knees. He cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Now think about that. This is very similar to what we see Messiah saying on the cross. And what does it show? At the time when Stephen is being utterly rejected by the leaders of his people by the leaders, the spiritual leaders of Israel. And not only are they rejecting him, they are putting him to death. He is being stoned. And his thought is not on himself. He calls upon, and that's what it literally says, he calls upon the name of Yeshua. And we read here that he falls upon his knees, that is submissiveness, it is an act of acceptance. He's accepting his faith, but it doesn't change. He's accepting his fate, and it doesn't change his faith. He cries out in a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And this he said, then he did what? He fell asleep. Now, that is an idiom for dying. But it's put in these terms for one main reason. When you fall asleep, you expect to wake up. And therefore, whenever death is alluded to as falling to sleep, it's not a speaking to soul sleep. That's a wrong understanding. It is speaking about a future hope in the resurrection. You lay down to sleep in order to rise up. So this scripture is telling, it's an allusion to the resurrection. And then finally, look at the last sentence we read here. Some Bibles have it, the first verse of chapter 8. But Shaul, that is Saul, that is Paul. 
It says, he was consenting, consenting, but the word here in Greek comes from three words. The word dokeo, which is I think or it seems to me, and then the word you, which is good, you, e, you. It means good. So it seems good, and then the word soon, which is with. So he was agreeing with. It seemed good. What they did, he was with them in seeing this as the right thing to do. So Saul, he was consenting to this one, referring to Messiah, his death. He heard all these things, and he agreed with who? Not the prophets, not Moses, not his his those ones who were followers of Messiah, but rather he agreed with the leadership of the nature, nation. And what this is doing is foreshadowing that Paul needed a radical change. And I say, perhaps you need a radical change. And that is founded in receiving Messiah, a biblical Messiah, one that the Torah testifies to, one that the Spirit, prophets prophesied concerning. And it's only when we have a proper understanding of the law and the prophets, then we're going to rightly understand who Yeshua is. We're going to discern his character. We are going to be able to rightly understand his work, his ministry. And finally, we're going to be in the right position to respond to it in a way that's pleasing to him. And that may mean that we'll be rejected, that we'll be hated, that we might even be put to death and suffer. But what does Stephen do? He casts his eyes on the heavens. And that is an idiom for a kingdom expectation. Many times we find in the New Covenant this term, a kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom and heaven go together. He was looking towards the kingdom, and he called upon Yeshua. Not for, save me, help me, deliver me, stop this. What was his thought? One of mercy, one of grace, one of forgiveness. Do not charge them with this sin, meaning not on my account. It wasn't a big deal to be put to death from Stephen's standpoint. Because what it did was to bring him into intimacy with Messiah, face to face in the kingdom of heaven. And may I close by saying this, we need to be more kingdom minded. We need to look just not in the three weeks that we studied Acts chapter 7, but a wise individual will read this over and over, looking at the things that we discuss and focusing on them, and learning more about this important seventh chapter of the book of Acts. Well, I'll close with that until next week. May God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.